Imagine the National Basketball Association without speed, height, and exceptional ball handling skills. That was the reality in 1946 before the arrival of George Mikan, the gentle giant and the first big man of basketball. Today he is known simply as Mr. Basketball. By standing tall, George Mikan used his height, competitive spirit, and passion for the sport to influence the format and success of today's National Basketball Association. He took a stand and refused to accept stereotypes, pushing himself to new levels in basketball, making the game more competitive and setting the stage for the popularity of the NBA today. George Mike was born on June 18, 1924 in Joliet, Illinois. In his teens, George was an athlete but not considered a top athlete. In fact, he was rejected by the coach at Joliet Catholic High School and was told that basketball players didn't wear glasses. Due to a childhood injury, George had to wear thick rimmed glasses his entire life. Ironically, these became his signature trademark and were one of the first visual signs of the stand he would take to change the sport. He transferred to Quigley Prep and played basketball his senior year where he attracted the attention of DePaul University, who offered him a scholarship at DePaul. He played for the legend coach, Ray Myers, who took one look at George Mikan and said, this guy is my future. Basketball at the time had tall, slender players. Mikan towered over every other player and was much broader. He did not have the speed and agility of the smaller players. However, Ray Myers saw in Mikan a new type of athlete, one that could change the sport of basketball and take a stand against the negative comments about players with extreme height and size. George Mikan career, but I never understood who it was until I got older and did a little research. I'm like, why is everybody saying do the George Mikan drill? I mean, they showed us the drill. It was a drill close to the basket where he was put in on the right side and jump off one leg, and then you catch it and go on the other side using your left hand uh, with one leg up. And you can do that continuously, whatever the number may be that the coach is asking. Meyer made Mike and his project and made him work out with the college boxers take dancing classes and run through a special drill eventually called the Mike and Draw that taught him how to shoot with both hands and develop more speed and strength. Ray Myers was one of the first coaches to incorporate tall strong men especially as centers and soon after other colleges were scouting for players like George Mike Big men who could score more points, sweep more rebounds off the rim or backboard, make more spectacular blocks in general, entertain in ways they haven't seen before. Uh, I would say back in the, the 70s, I mean the 60s, 70s, in the 80s and 90s, it was important. I don't think the two, in, the, in this era that we're in now, it's not as important because a lot of uh, centers don't even you know, post up, low post uh, to the basket. But when he was playing, yeah, it was the ball had to go inside, meaning four or five feet from the basket. The ball had to touch your biggest player uh, so he could make some, some things happen uh, close to the basket. Um, you know, I'd rather take a, a four foot shot than a foot shot, but you don't, you don't see that in today's game. DePaul's team was built around Mikan's force on goaltending. Goaltending occurred when the player hits the ball on its upward or downwards flight. Basically, a tall player would catch or bat away any shot to go through. We would set up a zone defense that had four men around the key and I would guard the basket. I can recall when the other team took a shot, I'd just go up and tap it out. Officials were wondering what the long-term effect 
of these players were to be on the game. In 1943 through 1944, there was a trial ban of goaltending which was entirely made into a permanent rule. Mikan's diminution as a center changed the way the position was played in college and in the NBA. Who was watching Mikan as well as a few other large centers as they revolutionized the position. In 1946, he entered the professional basketball, once again standing tall with his attitude that he was going to make an impact on the game of basketball. He signed for with the Chicago Gears for $60,000 over five years plus $25,000 signing bonus. He was the highest paid basketball player at the time. He went into the pros at 6'10 and 245 pounds, being one of the largest players in the world. In 1948, he went to the Minnesota Lakers. His career exploded and he became a legend, changing the game of basketball in the NBA. In his first year, he led the league in scoring with 1,195 points in 56 games and took them to win the league championship. Mikan didn't seem to single-handedly overpower the rest of the league at times so much so that the NBA tried to make it more difficult for him to score by extending the width of the key from 6 feet to 12 feet. In 1951, informally, the rule was known as the Mikan Rule and came after years of lobbying and complaints from owners and fellow players. Mikan used to position himself two feet from the basket and score with the easy hook shot which was deadly accurate due to his height and physicality. I think he had a, a, a tremendous impact on, on certain things that um, and, 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 and you can see it you know even today that you know the rules are changing you know each time someone's dominant comes in so I think he was one of the dominant players back in his era uh, so the rules and things were, you know, trying to change and, and to help other teams be better because he was so dominant on the defensive end and and on offense, you know, offensive end by him being so close and tall to the basket, it was easy for him to score, so they wanted to expand um, the free throw line, extend it, they wanted to get widen the lane so he wouldn't be as close to the basket. After the foul lane was widened, Mikan did not score as many points but still dominated the game. Every time the league changed the rule, he adjusted his game, proving to his naysayers that there was much more to him than just height. Ames decided on a new strategy, which was to control the court by holding the ball and running down the clock. After a loss to the Fort Wine Pistons, with a score of 19 to 18, the lowest scoring game in NBA history. A new rule change was installed in the 1954 through 1955 season. The 24 second shot clock is introduced. When he retired after nine professional seasons, he had seven championships, led the league in scoring three times, reboating twice, and playing in the first four All-Star games. He's named the MVP in 1953. He is also in the NBA record books for retiring with the most seasons in which he led league in fouls. Years later, he was continued to receive awards. In 1959, he was introduced in the Basketball Hall of Fame. He also was named to the 20th, 30th, and 50th anniversary NBA All-Time Team. Died on June 1st, 2005, just short of his 81st birthday. Today, 
a nine-foot bronze statue stands in the Target Center of Minneapolis, featuring George Mikan and his famous hookshot. David Stern, former NBA commissioner, stated, George Mikan truly revolutionized the game and was the NBA's first true superstar. We may never see one man impact the game of basketball as he did. By taking a stand and bringing new skills and a fierce attitude to the game, George Mikan changed the National Basketball Association. His influence on basketball will never be forgotten.